Thanks for joining us on this Sunday morning on The Real Story. I'm Aisha Bo in for Jen Bernstein and Al Terzi. Well, parents were holding their breath this past Wednesday as Connecticut announced preliminary plans for students to return to school in a post coronavirus world. We expect to get even more detailed information come tomorrow, Monday. But until then, joining me now is Connecticut Education Commissioner Dr. Miguel Cardona. Commissioner, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And we'll just dive right into it. The announcement that a lot of folks were waiting for came yesterday. Uh, first and foremost, you said you all talked to thousands of stakeholders here. Just break down what went into making this decision and how we arrived at yesterday's announcement. Sure. So from March, we've been hearing uh, about uh, distance learning and remote learning, how that was going. Uh, we heard from students that they appreciated the work that was going into it and that they're able to connect. But we know that the distance learning wasn't uh, a it wasn't it doesn't uh, replace the, the classroom experience. And we heard from families. We heard from students. We heard from teachers that it just distance learning was not uh, a good replacement for long term uh, instruction. We know that uh, we health and safety were the primary uh, indi uh, reasons why we had to cancel classes, and we wanted to make sure that we promoted the health and safety of our students and our staff. Um, as we continue to listen over the last two to three months, whether it was focus groups or surveys, uh, health and safety remained a priority, as did um, giving students opportunities to learn in school when possible. So given the success that Connecticut has had with the drop of infection rates, and as a matter of fact, we're one of the top states in the country uh, we felt that uh, working with our Department of Public Health, we can establish some um, guardrails for districts to plan for full in-person instruction, for hybrid, which means only uh, some students come in. And then ultimately, if necessary, and the data suggests, we need to ramp down for remote learning again, uh, depending on the data. So that's what we outlined yesterday. We wanted districts to have as much time to plan for full in-person, for a hybrid version that has only uh, some students coming in, and then for a full remote learning option as well. And I want to just go into, in a nutshell, for folks that maybe didn't catch the news release yesterday, just um, a vague idea right now of what school may look like for folks when they head back in the fall. Sure. You know, we, we talk a lot about the health pandemic, and I think everyone, including educators and families, recognize we're also in an education emergency. Uh, students being out of school for so long, um, coming back in and having that social emotional connection with their peers as well as the adults, uh, the caring adults in our schools is critically important. But that doesn't mean that school's gonna go back to normal. You know, it, it doesn't mean that we can expect uh, a reopening that looks like what school looked like prior to March. Uh, what it would be is uh, a very carefully developed plan with input from teachers, principals, superintendents, parents that allow students to access learning inside the schoolhouse with social distancing, with masks, with hygiene, different hygiene standards, different monitoring uh, expectations. And uh, we're, we're expecting that while we want children to be in the school, we recognize that their experience in the schoolhouse is going to be different than what they had before. But we do think that we can, given the success we've had in Connecticut, lowering the numbers, we do so in a safe way. Um, and I just want to mention one of the some of the ideas that you all have in place right now. We're talking about students and staff wearing masks, doing the cohort method. Um, but one of the things we saw when school closed back in March is there were those communities who maybe the students and parents were not ready for distance learning, whether it be access to Wi-Fi, access to a laptop. Um, are there plans right now to address that in the sense that we go into a hybrid situation or uh, worst case scenario, we have to go back to distance learning? Yeah, that's a great question. We are putting emphasis on trying to build up the infrastructure needs to promote uh, remote learning in a better way than we did the first time. While it was heroic what was done uh, the last three or four months, we know that if we have to go back to that, we have the time to prepare for it. What we're doing is looking at identifying our CARES Act funds uh, to support device distribution in addition to the wonderful work from our philanthropist partners to put 60,000 laptops in the hands of students, we know we still need more. We're also 
uh, trying to support the, the use of the governor's uh, education funds to address the digital divide, which means putting devices in the hands of kids and improving the connectivity, as well as the content, so that when students are online, they have good content. So we are focusing on that, and we're saying that if the requirement is that we ramp down and we go back to distance learning, we hope that our students have a better opportunity to access learning through those means. And since the announcement yesterday, uh, one of the questions we've been getting in our email is when it comes to students who may have special needs. Are there specific details that you might be able to provide with parents who may have a child um, with special needs, how the state is going to handle that, or would it be up to the districts individually to come up with a plan? Well, we know the districts uh, understand their learner needs better than you know, uh, the state, which is a little bit removed from the specific needs of the, the districts. But we also know that because we work closely with districts, that there are students with significant disabilities that remote work, remote learning doesn't really work well for them. And we've heard from parents over the last three and a half months that um, not being in a schoolhouse is having significant negative effects on children. Uh, so what we're trying to do is give guidelines for districts to follow to maintain health and safety when students are brought in. And we recognize that uh, when we share those and when we have districts augmenting those with uh, protocols and safety strategies that they can do in their districts, that uh, will ensure that students and staff can be uh, safe while they're providing in-school instruction. We also know that there are some families that feel like uh, they are not comfortable sending their children to school. Uh, we've heard from families whose children are vulnerable and they would rather uh, have their children continue learning from home. We want to provide opportunities for families to do that as well uh, because we recognize that you know part of this process, which is unprecedented, is to build confidence in the systems that are going to be put in place to promote health and safety. I think that's critically important. And you know this is uh, the beginning point of those conversations. We we know uh, that the plan is going to remain fluid and that it has to remain fluid so that we create environments where people feel comfortable going, both students but also our educators. Right, and um, I mentioned at the beginning of this that you all did get input from different stakeholders. Have you all heard any feedback yet from those educators since releasing this plan? There's a lot of concern about, uh, well, not having the specifics, um, but I've heard from educators that are eager to get back to, with, with their students. Um, eager to get back into some routine, some normalcy for, for the learners that they serve. Um, I heard from district leaders also that they're uh, looking forward to being able to go back and forth if there's health and safety risks that require a ramp down. But there are many concerns about what this means for the classroom teacher, what this means for the paraeducator. And you know we'll be sharing more, more details uh, Monday, but I think it's important to note also that the plans that the districts are developing, we want there to be input from teachers. We want there to be input from stakeholders that work in the schools, from parents. That's part of the benefit of having districts develop their plans is that it's not a plan that somebody's giving to them. We're providing those guardrails and districts will work with their teams to develop those plans and then reach back and say, this is where we're struggling or this is what support we need to make it happen. Um, and we're confident that with the input of our educators and our uh, district folks that we're going to come up with a plan that not only builds confidence, but uh, is able to provide in-school instruction. And you touched on this um, quickly. I know you guys will release more details come Monday, but are there any efforts right now to make sure you're getting the word out um, to those who need to know, whether it's educators, parents, districts? Um, How is the state going about doing that? So we're communicating regularly. Uh, right after this call, um, I will be having a conversation with regard to um, communication strategies uh, to give folks an opportunity to um, digest the plan. The plan is about 50 pages. Uh, to digest it, to uh, ask questions, to uh, share re reservations and concerns. We want to make sure that this plan is for Connecticut. We want to make sure that um, this is our path forward. You know, I talked about an educational emergency. Well, together, we're going to get out of that emergency. But it, it can't be uh, a one-size-fits-all, nor can it be a top down. We know that we need the voice of our educators, of our parents, of our students, and quite frankly, we have to ensure health and safety. So that means that there are certain things like face coverings, which many parents have communicated their concerns about having their children wear face coverings. We agree. It's difficult to wear face coverings. It's it's not 
It's not something that kids are used to. But we also know that first and foremost, we have to ensure health and safety. And there might be tweaks along the way. There might be adjustments or guidance that shifts based on what we're learning. But we want we want our educators to know that um, this is an iterative process, that this is our starting point, that yes, we want to plan for a full in-school return of students. Our data right now in Connecticut is really good, but I can't tell you what's going to happen in two weeks. You know, we have the, um, the unique uh, challenge of having to predict two months out. Um, in no other sector do, do you see that. But because we want to give districts an opportunity to plan, we have to predict out. And for us in Connecticut, we want to make sure that we have the best option to allow for students to come in in a safe way where we're promoting health and safety. But we also have a hybrid version where if we have to reduce the number of students that come in or if we have to go fully remote, we want to make sure that our Connecticut students have those options available uh, so that we can give them the best they, they can get to continue to learn and reduce some of those gaps that were created over the last three months. Um, and one of the things I want to touch on before I let you go this morning is transportation, which is a key to going back to in-person learning. And it is also a part of the initial plan that you all released on Wednesday. Um, for parents who may be nervous to put their kids on a school bus with other children, how do you address that? How do you make sure that kids are putting on their masks when they're in the bus? Are there plans to reinforce that idea that, hey, your kids will be safe when they come on this bus? The recommendation is to uh, have monitors where possible, especially when you have young children. Uh, we know that uh, normalizing different routines will take time. We know that normalizing the routine of wearing face coverings uh, in transportation is something that we have to work with children on. Uh, we know that it's not simple. There, there are no easy answers here. Uh, we feel that if there are uh, families that choose not to send their children, that it might lessen the number of students that ride buses. But we still have to make decisions that, based on the health and safety of our students and staff. And if we see that buses are overcrowded, we have to adjust bus runs or we have to split students so that they're not crammed onto one bus. You know, We have to have a common sense approach to this. There's no perfect science to this, but we have to have a common sense approach that promotes health and safety and builds confidence in returning to school or else it's not gonna work. Um, so the guidelines that we have are broad enough to share what the requirements are, but also give districts the opportunity to be innovative and work with their educators and their other stakeholders to make sure that the plan works for that community. All right, Dr. Cardona, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I nice wish we had more you. time to dive into these topics here more specifically, but as we've mentioned, that you are planning to release more details come Monday. Yes, have All a great right. day. Thank you so much. All right, and up next, Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin and efforts on police reform. Make sure you stay with us. The Real Story will be right back.